My name is Danica, I'm a contributing editor at Book Riot, and today I want to talk about the book Me and White Supremacy by Layla Saad. So since the George Floyd protests began, I've been thinking about what I need to do to further my own anti-racist education, and I ended up having a discussion with my best friend who's also white who's feeling the same way, and we decided to do kind of a two-person book club to hold ourselves accountable for that. I had heard good things about Layla Saad's workbook Me and White Supremacy, so we thought that would be a good place to start from, and I've just finished the workbook, and I wanted to talk about why I think anyone benefiting from white privilege should read this book, especially if you think of yourself as a good white person, if you feel like you've already kind of got a handle on things. Basically, if you're white and you think you don't have a lot of work to do around anti-racism, I would definitely pick this book up. So Me and White Supremacy it was originally an Instagram challenge. Every day for 28 days, so for a moon cycle, Layla Saad would post a writing prompt, starting with Me and white privilege, and then people who are taking part in the challenge would comment with their answers. Now it's been published in book form as a workbook, and it has a little bit more context and lead up to it, but there are still the original videos you can watch that Layla Saad made during the Instagram challenge. There are seven of these videos, and they're each about an hour long, and I found those hugely helpful as I was going through it. She has an amazing way of being able to call you out on the things that are coming up and the impulses you might have. She was kind of watching what people were doing in the comments and cutting things off before they really got a chance to get started. So although you can do the workbook in isolation, I definitely recommend watching the videos because they provided a lot of context and kind of corrections for me that really helped. I really struggled trying to make this video because I wasn't sure how to talk about this book. If I'm being honest going into it, I really considered myself a kind of good white person. I knew I had a lot to learn, but I felt like I had a good foundation. I felt like I had to educate myself about history and theory, but I didn't really think about myself as being racist. And reading this book completely shattered my illusions of being somehow an exception to the rule, or that I had anything less than a lifetime of work to do. The questions, the prompts are brutal. They ask you to really dig into your buried, unconscious biases that have been instilled in you as a white person. Some of the questions ask you to really face what do you actually think about other races? What are your assumptions? What are your automatic associations? And then it asks you to keep digging. So why do you feel that way? How have you demonstrated it in your own life? When has this been harmful for other people? What consequences do these ideas have? Why are you holding on to this toxic belief structure? How are you benefiting? As I understand it, in the original Instagram challenge, people were really holding each other accountable, and especially black women were coming in and holding people accountable. So they were sacrificing their time and energy to come into these comments that have all of this hate and toxicity that people were kind of exercising, and told people when they needed to dig deeper, when they were being too surface level and lazy about the answers to the these prompts. And that's something I find really interesting about the book itself, because Layla Saad says multiple times, I'm not going to hold your hand, I'm not going to give you a gold sticker for doing the work that it's your responsibility to do. So when you're going through this in the workbook format, it's up to you to hold yourself responsible and to do that work of digging deeper and asking the difficult questions. Which means it's possible to read this book and not get anything out of it because you're not doing that work, you're not digging deep. It would be easy enough to read through this and not actually do the writing, even though the book says multiple times that that's not acceptable and that's not how Saad wants anyone to interact with this work, you could write really surface level answers to these questions and write more about what you want to be true about yourself, what you would like to believe you think, without doing that substantial thinking about it. But if you do the actual work and dig into it, you will find so much. I couldn't believe how much I was digging up about myself that I wasn't consciously aware of. How much white supremacy was lurking in my subconscious thoughts, was informing my actions in ways I wasn't aware of. Personally, the biggest takeaway I had from this is how obsessed I am with optical allyship. And optical allyship, or performative allyship, is trying to make it look like you're doing the work, trying to make it look like you're not racist, and being more concerned with appearances than with actually doing anything helpful. It's basically just furthering your own brand as a good white person 
person or as a non-racist person. It's being more focused on what reflects well on you than what is actually useful. It's one of the reasons I hesitated to make this video because I didn't want to be making it from a place of look at what a good ally I am and I didn't want to be making it to try to seem like a good white person because that's definitely not what I got out of this book. What I got out of this book is that there are no good white people by which I mean that if you are raised in a white supremacist society as I was and if you absorb that messaging your whole life through media and also just through walking through the world it's impossible to somehow emerge on the other side as a completely non-racist person. And besides, when the whole system is racist, when the whole system is corrupt and unfair, there's not really kind of a neutral non-racist. Either you are working to dismantle that system or you are furthering and upholding that system. You can't really be in between because you're inside the system, so you have to be doing something to either take it down or build it up. So every white person has absorbed those messages to some degree degree. It's whether you're aware of it or not. And it's our responsibility to counteract those messages, to do that unlearning, and to dismantle those systems. I realized that I was so obsessed with not seeming racist that it was furthering racism. If you're more concerned with not seeming racist as a white person rather than dismantling racism, then you're gonna retweet the right things and not say racist things, but you're not gonna actually get involved with anti-racist activism. Because, and one of the other unfortunate things I realized about myself is that you're probably going to associate anything to do with race with racism. So it's safer to just not be involved with anything that has to do with race. But there is no unmarked neutral race. There's no media or organization that is somehow not dealing with race. So by trying to avoid it, you're just turning towards whiteness. And if you're just worried about being called racist, then isn't it safer to just be around white people all the time and never discuss race or racism? Me and white supremacy ask white people to examine our personal relationships to white supremacy. Not intellectualizing, not theory, not generalizations, but personal thoughts and feelings and history and actions. It's not exactly that it's brand new information, though I did learn a lot from reading it. It's that lens of really looking inward. I had never really looked directly at my own prejudices in that way. So the workbook asks things like, what are your associations with black men, with immigrants? What is your relationship to white saviorism? And then there are follow-up questions, and for every prompt we're asked to provide concrete details. What are examples of when you've thought this or said this or done this? Why do you think this? How does it benefit you? It's difficult work, and I feel ridiculous saying that because white people have to think so little about race that there is that white fragility that having to think about racism feels so hard when people of other races don't get the option of just not thinking about it. But while I was going through through this workbook, I found myself dreading it a little bit more every day because it gets deeper and more difficult as it goes on. And I was discovering things about myself that I didn't want to know. I was realizing how much and how often I value my own comfort over other people's safety and dignity. It's funny to be so heartily recommending a book that made me feel like shit about myself, honestly, but I think you can only fix a problem once you know that it's there. I also found it so useful to have this vocabulary at hand. Once I familiarized myself with it, I could see it popping up in myself and with others. So I'd be writing and then be like, oh, there's white exceptionalism again. Or I'd be thinking and think, oh, that's white apathy creeping in. And by having that framework, it also made it harder to avoid or justify it because I could see it for what it was. It's easy to think, oh, I don't really think this applies to me. It's harder when the book you're reading says, and if you think this doesn't apply to you, that's the problem. I think that racism needs to be fought on a lot of levels at once because it's everywhere. It's entwined with everything. There is blatant, unapologetic personal racism, which I think is what most white people associate with racism. But that's only one small part of it. And the systemic racism that is built into structures that allows them to passively perpetuate racism regardless of who is part of the system at any one time, that is particularly dangerous. But I still think that white people 
need to acknowledge the subconscious racism within us because those thoughts, those associations, they inform the actions that we take. Me and white supremacy repeatedly asked us to ground our thoughts in reality. What do these beliefs lead to? What is the material impact of this thinking? As someone who considered myself a good white person, I would never knowingly perpetuate racism, but how would my associations with different races inform who I go out of my way to help more as a teacher? Who I encourage the most? Who I think can work well without a lot of external support? How is it affecting where I spend my money and what media I absorb and which messages I pass along to others? And of course on booktube which books I read and how I talk about them. Me and white supremacy really helps me to realize my own white fragility, how quickly I seem to get overwhelmed thinking about race. In one of the videos she talks about how whiteness can be infantilizing, which really resonated with me. This kind of helplessness about race. As white people, we benefit from whiteness at every turn. We get invisible boosts in life that we aren't even aware of. We are guided around stumbling blocks. We don't even see what we get to avoid. That is not a lack of race. We are affected by our race all the time, just as much as people of color are. It's just that it's almost always in a positive way for us. So the very least we can do is educate ourselves. We all absorb the messaging we were raised in, it's impossible not to, but we have a responsibility to do better than just repeating the prejudices that were instilled in us. And that's why I think white people need to read Me and White Supremacy. It's perfect for if you want to be anti-racist but don't really know what that means. I wouldn't recommend giving it to someone who is reluctant because it does rely on you doing the work and pushing yourself and holding yourself accountable. So if you're giving this to someone else, I would probably start with a more hand-holdy 101 guide. Also, if you want to read this with multiple people, there is a specific way that these book groups should be run that saw details in the book, so make sure that you check that out first before you try to do it as a book club. She said if it's three or more people, you should be following this format. She also says that it's for anyone who benefits from white privilege, who is white passing, and she recommends that people do this multiple times, which I definitely understand because I feel like I've just scratched the surface. There's so much packed in here, and I think it'll be a lifelong journey to really recognize all of it when it comes up. I definitely want to keep coming back to it and doing it at least once a year. And let me know in the comments if you have any recommendations for anti-racist books. I think the next book I'm going to read is So You Want to Talk About Race because that's one of the things I really want to get better about is being able to call out racism and talk about racism and kind of practice that skill so that I don't hesitate when it comes up. So let me know if you have any other recommendations or if you've done me on white supremacy and you want to share any of your thoughts feel free to leave them down below and thank you for watching